Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode four of Matrix Mash. I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio, and with me is my good buddy, Robert Phoenix, from robertphoenix.com and 11th House Astrology. We've had a little bit of a break for a couple of weeks, kind of energies shifting around, and I was on a little bit of a vacation and whatnot, but um, thank you for all the wonderful responses we've been getting for our shows, and we are back for another one with you today. We're going to talk about politics, gymnastics, and it's even going to get a little bit personal. Robert, welcome back. Hey, Emily. It's always great to be with you. And yeah. uh, you and I have a lot of fun together, and I love hanging out with you. And let's see what kind of uh, trouble we can uh, we can cause. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, might, this might be a little trouble for me, but uh, hey, that's what I'm here for. I'm big trouble. All right. So um, for those of you who follow Robert and myself, um, it's been about, what, nine months now since we did that show on USA Gymnastics um, when all the testimonies were taking place with um, – the Larry Nasser thing. And really, you know, though he's in jail and there's been all of this attention to it, really not much has happened um, as far as changing the culture around USA Gymnastics. And this has been disturbing to me. And, you know, it, it obviously continues to be disturbing to some of the people, but others seem to, you know, okay, Larry Nasser's in jail. This was just the problem with this one guy. There was some corruption, but people are really still failing to see what is actually going on here, like the depth of this problem, what it's about. This isn't just about sexual abuse and co corruption. This is also about systemic mind control, the combination of politics and athletics, um, even identity politics to a certain degree. Um, one of the things that's happened just recently is USA Gymnastics hired an intern. They, they fired Katy Perry, who had been brought on after Steve Penny had been fired and uh, she was just doing more covering up and not doing anything. So they got rid of her. And then they hired an interim CEO named Mary Bono, who is the wife of the late Sonny Bono and a former Republican congresswoman. And she came in and she was CEO there for less than a week and was fired, but was kind of fired for, you know, like the, the, the main reason it got attention that she was fired is, is kind of silly. And there's a, a deeper problem underneath there that, has been addressed a lot less. Um, finally, Allie Raceman, the Olympian, is starting to you know, talk about that and address it. She seems the one to be the most upset about it. But the main focus, the outcry, was really against about the identity politics aspect of this. And so the main reason she was fired was because somebody had found that in a tweet back in September, she had blocked off the Nike sign from her shoes in, in, I guess, protest against the, the Nike ad with the stuff with Colin Kaepernick and whatever. So, you know, she's a Republican, whatever. So there was outcry against that because Simone Biles, who was a Nike athlete, sort of didn't like that. Now, I have no problem with Simone Biles and, and whatever, but this is not a good reason why she was fired. The better reason, which has been acknowledged a little bit, but only secondary, is that she works for the law firm that was employed by USA Gymnastics to help handle the PR problem of this Nary Nasser case, right? And seeing as she used to be a congresswoman, it's very obvious to me what her role here is. And her role is to be point person, to know what's going on, to cover stuff up, and to be the fox watching, guarding the hen house. You know, she's got to be probably a good buddy of Dianne Feinstein, right? So that's sort of my assessment of what the latest thing of, has been going on you know, in general, we can kind of talk about that and then we're going to get into some other stuff too. What do you think about that, Robert? Well, I think it's a, I mean, just, just from like the identity politics and the social landscape piece, um, I think it's very clear that Nike has an agenda. Mm -hmm. And, and we talked, I think, a great deal about um, Serena Williams mm -hmm. as being part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk a whole lot about Colin Kaepernick. We touched on him a little bit, um, but clearly he is somebody that um, they're very attached to at a brand level mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, the, the, the Nike's products and Nike's ideology moving forward. And, um, and you can see where this is, you know, the, the, you know, Ka Kaepernick has, in a lot of ways, become the Howard Hughes of football. Like, yeah. like he doesn't talk to anybody. Um, he'll tweet every now and then. Um, but by and large, you know, he's a Scorpio, so he operates in a very Scorpionic fashion, almost from sort of behind this veil. Mm -hmm. Now, he did, he did uh, 
try or he's in the he's in the act of trying to copyright his image you know the big fro and the fu manchu and you know, the, apparently they want to turn his image into lampshades or i don't you know to me the whole thing is really bizarre and this this kind of matches up to corey good trying to copyright ssp right and uh 20 and back and all of this kind of stuff like it's like a similar but different right same same different yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, I mean, the whole copywriting thing really took hold when, uh, who was it, uh, 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 the coach for the Lakers, um, Pat Riley. Mm -hmm. Pat Riley copyrighted the phrase three-peat. Mm. He actually copyrighted, right? And so he owns the copyright to three-peat. Now, I don't know how much he gets off of that. I mean, if it's used in some form of advertising, he gets something. But, but the Kaepernick thing is odd because it's pretty clear that Kaepernick represents social Marxism. He's aligned himself with social Marxism. Mm -hmm. And now he's, he's doing his best to create his brand and copyright his image, which seems so anti-social Marxist in some ways. But, it, but it, it's kind of fitting in, in a But that is the whole like left thing now. It's like the corporate neo-Marxism, right? That's right. I'm just going to say that's the, that's the new model is corporate neo-Marxism. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, Simone Biles, who you mentioned, who is a, a Nike athlete, I'm starting to see, you know, more and more advertising for her mm -hmm. on television. Mm -hmm. So this is another person they're bringing into their stable um, to be able to promote and promote along the lines of identity politics. Uh, these are black Americans mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're trying to create, some kind of unified front mm -hmm. along the lines of identity politics, youth, race, culture. Um, it's you know it's an interesting move by Nike. They're clearly defining who they want to be, where they're moving, they're going to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. And something as like really trivial as blacking out the Nike swoosh mm -hmm. as a tweet uh, to get one fired is is it's ludicrous it's insane particularly when they have the other skeleton in their closet right that's not such a problem well, there's much, yeah there's much bigger fish to fry <laughs> right and they then they found they found a, a plausible out and allowed her to you know hit the streets and probably get a little money on the side and um yeah it, yeah so it's very odd very strange uh, Mary Bono, you know, she's she's got a history. Yeah, a lot of people get married. She's been okay. married four times. Um, but she also apparently was a gymnast in Southern California in the '80s when a lot of we'll, we'll get into this. We'll get into this later. But in the '80s, Southern California was a hotbed of sexual abuse and gymnastics, and so she apparently was. And part of the reason she wanted to do this job is because she had witnessed something happen to a teammate of hers and not spoken up, and she'd felt bad about it all these years later. So she's connected in an emotional way. But go ahead with what you wanted to say about well, her. I mean, she... It's just, I think it's interesting that, you know, she wound up with, with Sonny Bono. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I haven't really looked into it all that much. But it wouldn't surprise me if Sonny was Cher's handler. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they had that kind of relationship in some ways. But, but I think also that Cher, you know, you know, could share broken free for programming. I, mm -hmm. I, I think I think share isn't share like um, what is she? She's um, um, she, she, is she related to the Kardashians? Like, isn't there like a like a distant connection? I mean, they're they're, they're they're probably of similar ethnic ethnic heritage. Yeah, look that up real fast. Share and Kardashian. Share and Kardashian. Let's see what comes up. Well, Kim Kim Kardashian is dressing as Cher quite frequently. They're similar to Cher. Let's see. Mostly, I'm finding that they like they, that she, Kim Kardashian is is obsessed with her. I'm not seeing that there's any relationship. Okay. Here. They're they're both Armenian. They're both Armenian. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so, you know, you know, was was Sonny Cher's handler? You know, and if that's the case. You know, did she, did, did he have kind of a, a handler relationship with Mary Bono at times? Mm -hmm. And as, and as soon as, um, I think after Sonny, Sonny passed away, she hooked up with um, the drummer of a country rock band, uh, Diamond Rio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
and again, this is all kind of like by association, but you know, we're how, doing free association here, right? How many degrees of separation are we talking about here? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and then the way that that Sonny and Sonny does this weird thing, you know, it's like, you would think that he's a, a hippie and a liberal and, but he's actually a Repu he winds up being a Republican, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, you know, kind of uh, a pro small government. Yeah, uh, sort of pro big business, takes a very different approach in his rock and roll lifestyle. And of course, the controversial death that he had on, on the ski slopes, right? Mm -hmm. And apparently he was a, you know, a really good skier. He's a double black diamond guy and really should have been able to get out of where he was and it didn't happen. There are theories that Sonny, you know, was off because he was planning on changing. Here's that, here's that word again, copyright. Mm -hmm. He was planning on changing the copyright laws uh, that had to do with artists and record labels and music publishers. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make them sort of, you know, more pro, pro musician. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where did we hear that story before? Buddy Holly. Mm -hmm. When Buddy Holly was, you know, coming up as an artist, very clearly he understood the disparity between the artist's rights um, and what the music publishers and Buddy right. Holly died in a plane crash, and Prince had to come down from a plane just days before he died. Remember, they had to emergency land his plane. Aaliyah yeah. died in a plane crash. There's been all of these musicians who have some of these outstanding issues with their record companies, right? Well, look, look at Leonard Skinner. Leonard, Leonard Skinner had a real big issue with MCA. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Leonard Skinner's plane comes down in a crash, right? Uh, what's interesting about the Buddy Holly plane crash is it happened um, right outside of, the, of a town called Mason. So, yeah, of course. Mason, Iowa, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, was there a foul play involved in, in the ending of Sonny Bono's life? P quite possibly. And then it's very interesting how Mary Bono gets elected very quickly. Uh, it's not uncommon. You know, we've seen wives take over for their husbands in various government positions. Jackie Spear took over for, um, what's his name, Leo, Leo, uh, Help me out now. Leo, 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 Leo Ryan, who okay. went, to, went to Jonestown. Okay. So this is not, it's not uncommon, but, you know, now, it's, now she's no longer a congresswoman, and now she's no longer with representing uh, the gym CEO of uh, USA Gymnastics. She was there for one week. The, now, did they replace her? So I'm, I'm not sure that she's been replaced at this point. I, you know, I do some level of research into this. This is disturbing on a personal level for me that I can kind of dip in and then I have to dip out for a while. Let me see if it's if USA, US Gymnastics CEO, Gymnastics current CEO, they may have no one. Let's see. Current CEO, current CEO, do we have one? Nope, uh, there's, I'm not seeing anything here. They're just still just talking about Carrie Perry being forced. They're not even talking about her having been there. So I don't think there's anybody right now. Right. I think, yeah, I don't think there's anybody right now. If I'm wrong, please correct me. I'm not intentionally leaving anything out here. Um, so she was there for a week, and then there's been this brouhaha. And, um, you know, one of the things, you know, so I've been paying attention for the last couple of weeks. You know, I've talked to you about it a few weeks ago. We were kind of in a few weeks off here. But then yesterday morning I woke up and in my YouTube feed, there was video of Ali Raceman on the Today Show talking about the problems going on in USA Gymnastics, mentioning all of the things that we've just mentioned. But then she's specifically speaking of a gentleman named Ron Gallimore, who's been a point person during all of this, who seems to be the only one who was in a high position that was definitely through evidence trails involved in cover-ups and hiding what was going on with Larry Nasser. He is still there. And she has mentioned his name several times in the interview and wanting to know, A, why is there still not? And this is what's so interesting, right? They've gone to Congress. They've testified all this stuff. They've had Dianne Feinstein and other politicians involved. There still hasn't been a proper law enforcement investigation of what's been going on, which should be clue number one, that there's intentionally things being hidden and covered up. Then they send a Republican Congresswoman there to be the CEO, right? But she's talking about Ron Gallimore, and she brings his name up several times. And um, Ron Gallimore is a figure in my life. And so I kind of woke up to that yesterday and got to spend the day sort of swimming around and stuff. And, you know, I met Ron Gallimore when I was a very young child. He would work out sometimes at our gym. And I believe a woman who I believe was his girlfriend also was around our gym. 
And, you know, he was a figure there, like in the early 80s, you know, he didn't work there really, but he was around sometimes. And then for several weeks, and I believe 1984, I did a show with him at the LA car convention, the Nissan exhibition and spent, you know, a couple of weeks in the afternoons there, me and a few other girls doing the show with him. And I just remember being absolutely entranced, dazzled, enamored of this gentleman who was, you know, many years, he's 16 years older than I am. And he had this trick that he did called the Gallimore flip. That was like, he stepped into it forwards and sort of turned around sideways and then flipped his legs over behind him. And it would be like, we would always be like, do it, do it. And he would do it to impress us. But, you know, like I, I just, you know, all these years later, as I remember just the details, I can still imagine being there, standing on the, the, the raised stage with him there and doing all this stuff. And, you know, it was that period in the early 80s when a lot of sexual abuse was going on in gyms around Southern California and is, you know, the p time period that I've targeted for a lot of things that, you know, have gone on with myself. And I'm not interested in reading anything into something that isn't true or making up a story or whatever. But, you know, I've done a lot of personal work in my healing and deprogramming around sexual abuse that happened for me at that age. And it's just very weird to me. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to personalize this. This is just what happened that here's this guy who's showing up in this discussion, who seems to be the point person for a lot of the cover up of what went on with Larry Nasser at USA Gymnastics. Everybody has been fired except for him. And he's this guy that like, I felt just kind of like weirdly enamored of as a kid, you know, you know, like just, oh, this guy was the neatest thing ever. He could do no wrong, which is, you know, making me wonder what, you know, like, what was his role in, you know, possibly um, in training or handling young female gymnasts at that period of time? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I can't say that I, I can't say that I have any memory of anything specific like that happening, but why is this person such a standout in my mind? And there's Allie Raceman talking about her on, on the Today Show, and um, she seems to be more feisty and Pest annoyed by she seems to be more interested. She was also talking about the problems with Mary Bono. She seems to have been the only one who was concerned about the actual legal connections of Mary Bono. She didn't talk about it so much in that interview, but she did mention something in some articles that I read. She seems to be maybe the closest on the trail of any of these gymnasts to recognizing that there may be something else, a deeper problem here than just a sexual abuse and a corruption kind of thing. I don't think she has any context for understanding the things you and I might understand about what could be going on here but she seems curious. And I like Allie Raceman. I've always appreciated her gymnastics and she's a hard worker. And, you know, I've felt a certain level of personal connection to her, even though I don't know her. It's not anything like weird like that, but you know, there's just certain people you identify with, you know, when you admire them or whatever. And there's lots of people who admire, I don't feel connected with. And, and, and I had some of that. We can get into that in just a few minutes, but um, you know, what's your take on this situation with Ron Gallimore and his position at USA Gymnastics and what might be going on? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, sort of glancing over an article on um, Deadspin while you were, you were sort of recounting the, your connection with Ron Gallimore and, you know, why, why you're, um, you feel like you're connected with Allie Raceman. And it's fascinating how he's been almost, uh, it's almost like he's been cloaked in some ways. Mm -hmm during this whole process because everybody around him has been dropping like flies. Uh, you, you see Penny, right? Uh, Luanne Pesic, Rhonda Fain, of course, Larry Nasser, who's in, who's in prison. Mm -hmm. and, and meanwhile, Ron Gallimore is like, he has one of those, um, you know, uh, Klingon cloaking devices, Romulan cloaking devices. And so you and I, before the show were, looking at his chart a little bit. And maybe, you know, if I bring in a little astrology, this might be able to describe, you know, why, uh, you know, why Gallimore has been able to almost be like an invisible man while everybody else has been quite visible to the point where Mary Bono, based on, you, you know, a funny little tweet that was kind of anti- Nike, even even she was dismissed. So, you know, astrologically, uh, Ron Gallimore is a Pisces. He was born on March seventh, nineteen fifty nine. 
Now, uh, you know, there are a lot of Pisces in the world, right? And a number of Pisces gymnasts, I'm sure. But what's interesting about Ron Gallimore is that currently Neptune, transiting Neptune, is right on his sun. And when that happens, it can create a couple of different effects. One of the effects is that his identity can be completely obscured. So from an astrological position, this could actually be very fortuitous. You know, Pisces is representative of water. And, and we get to water, we're to you know, all the different manifestations of water, you know, ice, liquid water, um, yes. steam, mist, yeah. fog, yeah. right? So there's a fog over this guy. I mean, literally, right? You know, everybody else is standing out like sore thumbs, but there's this kind of Piscean fog around him. Now that can change. And it can change very, very quickly if there's uh, an aspect that will, that might challenge that. Um, and generally speaking, that would be sometime maybe around September where there's an opposition, sun-sun opposition during that time. So he could go from being somebody who is sort of untouchable in some ways. In fact, he's even been elevated, right? To some, he's like on the, on the rules for the International Gymnast Federation. Mm-hmm. On the, so now he's, so, so if anything, this scandal has elevated Ron Gallimore mm-hmm. versus diminished any of his. Uh, which, which almost tells me that this is not just the USA gymnastics problem. This is an international gymnastics problem. And he's, he, he's kind of there to either oversee it or to ultimately, like, you know, maybe take a fall for it, right? Maybe, because that's what happens with Pisces. That's the other side of it. You know, so you, can, you, you, know, you can be invisible, invisible, invisible. Nobody sees you. And then all of a sudden there's an issue and everybody turns and looks and that fog bank is cleared away and there you are. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the scapegoat theme comes out with Pisces. So, I mean, they could go either way with, with, with him, but I would say by and large for now, he's got this Neptunian cover over his identity. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I would say that that's probably one of the reasons why um, he hasn't, gone down in the ship, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so you all, we, we were just, we, this has just all kind of come together right before we started. And we just kind of operated on some hunches and took some looks at stuff. And you were looking at his chart in relationship to Mary Bono's chart. And you found some interesting connections there. Yeah, before I go there really quickly, mm-hmm. before I go there, um, I'm looking at Jupiter in Ron Gallimore's chart. And it's at uh, one degree Sagittarius. So um, Jupiter is going to go into Sagittarius the day after the election, November 7th. Now it's going to take Jupiter probably about, mm, about five weeks to get to a point where it's squaring his sun. Okay. So look to the end of the year, right around maybe the last week in. December, um, where some more news or information may come out around Ron Gallimore, mm. because that would be the nature of Jupiter, Sagittarius, which is one of the kind. Of, I mean, there are two, there are a couple of planets that kind of co-rule sport. I mean, all the fire signs are involved in sports in some ways. Aries being the actual doing of the sport, Leo sort of the performance of the sport, and Sagittarius sort of being the sort of transcendental nature of the, of the sport and being outdoors, rural sports like football and baseball and golf, all the big outdoor sports, expansive stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That's what Sagittarius does. It's what Jupiter does. It, it brings things open. It expands. So there could be an expansion in a way that could be uncomfortable for Ron Gallimore by the end of the year. So I'm just pointing that out. Now, going back to the Mary Bono thing, you also said he's experiencing his Saturn return, right? Yeah, that's right. He is going through a Saturn return, a second Saturn return. Mm-hmm. That's, happening, that's happening right now uh, as, as we speak, which would kind of coincide with his promotion mm. to be involved with uh, the international... Uh, FIG, uh, yeah. FIG, right. And inherently, because he has Saturn and Capricorn in his chart, um, 
in most cases, not all of them, because I have salmon and cowboy in my chart, but in most cases, people that would have that would tend to be inclined to work within large structures, and then over time, they would rise to the top of these large structures. So we're seeing, you know, midlife, Ron Gallimore's ascent with Saturn mm -hmm. and Capricorn. It'll be interesting to see what happens with, I mean, he's in his second Saturn return now, so he's getting some of those promotions or, or being elevated. Uh, but it's going to be this Jupiter transit in uh, the last part of December. That'll be interesting to keep your eye on with him. Okay. Because at that time, Jupiter will also be like opposing his natal Mars and Gemini. And that, again, will expand, you know, that Mars at, um, what is it, where is it? It's odd. But he's got a lot of fire. You know, his chart reminds me in some ways of uh, that guy, Zlatlan Ibrahimovic, the soccer player in L.A. Mm -hmm. I, look, I look at his chart. That guy's chart is mostly fire, fire and air. You know, people have a lot of fire and air tend to be really dynamic people. They, I mean, he, like, he was super duper fiery, just a lot of dynamic energy, right? Yeah. Like a lot of quick twitch, like a lot of flash, a great smile, just, you know, like I'm, it's not easy to capture my attention and boy, did he capture my attention. Yeah. So he, with all the fire, he'd have a lot of charisma the, and oh, yep. the air, you know, would add, would add some circulation to that fire. And, and Pisces tends to be a bit mesmeric. You know, Pisces mm -hmm. is very interesting. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a water sign. It has, it has the quality to enchant. Mm -hmm. It has some enchanting quality to it. So you add that kind of enchanting, you know, Piscean quality with all this kind of dynamic and charismatic fire and air. This, this, I mean, just clearly um, he's somebody who could generate a lot of buzz. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, have that kind of enchantment piece. And with Saturn in uh, Capricorn, slowly rise to the top of his profession. Mm -hmm. So in interesting, interesting character, for sure, astrologically. Okay, so let's look at him with Mary Bono, and then we'll get back into some of the deeper personal aspects related to, to Ron Gallimore. So the one thing that really jumped out at me when we were looking at Mary Bono's chart is that, well... Ron Gallimore has transiting Neptune on his son, meaning that, you know, transiting Neptune is in conjunction with his identity symbolized by the sign of Pisces. Mary Bono has that in her navel chart. It's a bit wider. Uh, her son is at um, one Scorpio. She's a Scorpio. And then Neptune is at uh, 10 Scorpio. It's a very wide conjunction, but it's a conjunction nonetheless. So she has the sun Neptune thing going on as well. And sometimes with Sun Neptune people, just in general, like you don't know where they're coming from. You know, there's kind of at times an air of mystery around them. They're hard to kind of wrap your hands around. You know, who's this person about? What are they doing? What's their intention? It's not this, I mean, for her, it would be kind of even more pronounced because she's a Scorpio. And Scorpio tends to elicit, um, you know, kind of more polarizing uh, reactions in people. So uh, she's clearly an interesting case with that sun Neptune conjunction. And there, there is a bit of, um, again, there's the enchantment piece and especially with Scorpio. And there's a sex piece with Scorpio as well. And in fact, she's got, um, she has Mars and Scorpio and that's not too far from her, her Neptune either. So Mary Bono's interesting in the sense that she shares this aspect with what Ron Gallimore is going through, but she has it naturally in her chart. So trying to, you know, kind of pinpoint who she is, or, I mean, to your point, Emily, it's like, what was she doing there? You know, what was, what was the intention of bringing her in? Was she there to, uh, you know, cover things up, investigate a little bit of both? You know, we got this Nike thing, but is that really why she was like, that? I mean, to me, this typifies that sudden Neptune conjunction. Just don't know, right? I mean, she is taking a slight fall, a bit fall, but not a huge fall. But those things, those two things were interesting between Gallimore and Bono, both sharing that sudden Neptune aspect in regards to, you know, what's happening with USA gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at that, and I just kind of, on a hunch, I don't know why, asked Robert to take a look at my chart 
in relation to Ron Gallimore and my chart in relation to Allie Raisman. And then, and to look at them sort of all together. And it was just an intuitive thing to me to ask him and whatever. And um, it turned out to be kind of interesting, Robert. <laughs> what, oh, did, extremely what did we find? Right. So Ron Gallimore, his son is at uh, 15 Pisces. And uh, your moon is at 13 Pisces. So your moon is just two degrees removed from being absolutely smack on top of Ron Gallimore's sign. And generally speaking, in uh, synastry, when you know people you know come to me and ask me about relationships, um, and I see that sun uh, moon conjunction, it's like, well, that's a really good aspect to be connected with someone around relationship. Like, you know, it's one of the clear indicators that you would have something in common with a person. It's one generally considered one of the better aspects of marriage mm -hmm. in, in a relationship. And so with, when we get into Pisces, you know, Pisces begins to blur boundaries. And whatever those boundaries are, it can be age, it can be race, it can be culture, religion. You know, those boundaries get to become quite blurry and uh, indefinable. So with your moon and his son, there would already be kind of a, a preset or pre-made kind of um, merger on some level, like you'd already be connected. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, you would be much more open and receptive to him emotionally mm -hmm. uh, than other people maybe because of the relationship with the moon. I thought, I mean, that really jumped out. I thought that was, that was very interesting because you do, have, you do have a connection with this guy. I mean, and I said, I felt mesmerized by him. And to me, that seems like, you know, being enchanted with, mesmerized, or more open to somebody might be a, you know, a good uh, beneficial in an entrainment or handler kind of, kind of situation between, yeah or no? Yes, I think so. I mean, again, because those boundaries would, would they would just dissipate. And, and, and again, you know, sun mood are going to dissipate anyway, regardless, mm -hmm. because there, there would be some level of like some real, real, real simpatico, mm -hmm. real simpatico, like kind of understanding each other on an unspoken kind of level, right? Mm -hmm. And in Pisces, it can be very, very deep. Mm -hmm. And you very easily accessed in a lot of ways. And, you know, with your moon in your chart, square Neptune and square Mercury, I mean, it's really clearly an access point in your chart. Mm -hmm. You know, that if you were to trust somebody um, at a certain point in time in your life, um, it'd be very easy, I think, for them to kind of get in your chart. And, into your emotional core in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, because you've got that square with moon, moon Neptune and it opens things up, right? That's what it does. Not, not always in a good way. The influences, the influences can be um, counterproductive in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing too, I wanted to mention, which you and I didn't talk about in great detail is that his Mars is in Gemini and it's at 11 degrees and it's conjunct your Mercury. And that's behind the scenes. Your Mercury's in the 12th house. So that is a behind the scenes influence. So not only do you have the sun, the sun moon conjunction with him, but Mars Mercury as well. And when we get into Mercury, we get into the mind, right? Ah. And you've got Mercury and Gemini 12th house behind the scenes, you know, the hidden mind. So somebody who would have Mars conjunct your Mercury could somehow stimulate your thinking. Mm. in a certain way or along. So there are clearly, at the very least, two fundamental and, you know, really close to the surface connections uh, with Ron Gallimore in your chart. Interesting. So then I, I just went on down my, you know, whatever road I'd go to with the intuitive stuff. And I told Robert about a vision I'd had several years ago when I was sort of on the brink of like, the space between where my programming was breaking down and where I actively started to in a healthy way deprogram, having had this vision of Allie Raisman where 
like I kind of saw the side of her face and in the, in her face, I saw my face and I had this feeling of like, almost like some kind of connection or shared genetics. And, you know, we're both Jewish and, and, you know, darker complected and all that. So it could be nothing, but I felt for that moment, like, like I, I sort of had like an, an understanding or a knowing of this person. And, you know, I appreciated her gymnastics, but I haven't, you know, I don't have any other super strong knowledge of her or felt anything like that. But it was the weird to me that she showed up in that vision and that whole night sort of, you know, it, it was, it was in psychedelic, it was in a psychedelic space, you know, but there was this net, this sort of web over everything. I was having all sorts of stuff, visions about lots of things. And she just popped in for a second. It wasn't something that went on and on or anything like that. It's just, I never forgot it. Um, and then, so I asked Robert, I said, take a look at my chart in, in relation to hers. And he did. And here's what we have. <laughs> yeah. So it was pr pretty interesting. Um, so uh, Allie Raceman, uh, happens to be a Gemini, and her son is in Gemini at, at four degrees. Um, and uh, you have, um, well, your Mercury is in Gemini, so it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit off, right? It's not, it's, you know, it's still in that same place, right? So her son is at four degrees. Uh, Ron Gallimore's Mercury, uh, Mars is very close to your son, 11 degrees. And then there's your Mercury. So her son, Ron Gallimore's Mars, your Mercury, they're all kind of in alignment. They're all in your all in your 12th house. So that I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, her, her Mercury is at 26. And her Venus, this is where I thought it was really interesting. Her Venus is at five degrees cancer. And your son is at seven degrees cancer. So now we got a sun, sun Venus conjunction between you and Allie Raceman. You have a moon sun conjunction between you and Ron Gallimore. It's like, wow, this is this is really interesting, right? And when you make those connections, that means that they're all in kind of a you know 120 degree angle. So that's a trine. So there's there's certainly the reflection. You know, Venus represents relationship, um, and then the sun represents your identity. So there's there's kind of a reflection there. With uh, with her on a relationship level, and there was there was more. Um, the other thing that I looked at was her Mercury is at twenty six degrees, and uh, Gemini, so that's conjunct your your midheaven. I'm sorry, your uh, your rising sign. So there's all these interesting connections, like between you and her and Ron Gallimore on, on a personal level, um, and some of them even are a little bit transpersonal, like that sort of that stack that, that lines up in the 12th house, which is you know, a hidden house, a deep house, um, you know, a house that can be very institutional in terms of you know, church, uh, hospitals and recovery centers. You know, here, this wow. is interesting, right? This is interesting, because I never really thought about this. Is the 12th house representative of, say, uh, locations or places where people go to get programmed mm. absolutely because they're hidden tucked away you don't see them like you know they don't give they don't give tours you know to these places right yeah so that's definitely a 12th house uh location mm -hmm. i mean so, good but i'm just looking at these planets in your 12th house and that clearly that's you know, I'm not just yours, but uh, Allie Raceman and, and uh, Ron Gallimore's, they're all kind of hanging out there in that 12th house. It's interesting. So, you know, when I had that vision of looking at her, I had that moment of feeling like, and I don't mean this in a biological sense necessarily, but this feeling of this is like my sister, right? Or this is like some sort of shared genetics or shared experience. Now, she's a far better gymnast than I ever hoped to be and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's weird. Like, I can't say that I've, there's been lots of gymnasts that I've appreciated, enjoyed. And, you know, when I was younger, where he was huge fans of that I haven't had sort of like a feeling or whatever like that. Um, my other thing that I, when you bring Ron Gallimore into this, when we're talking about locations and programming, when you started, when we started digging into this and we saw that his father was a former professional football player, the first thing that jumped to my intuitive mind was, you know, for some reason, like OJ Simpson being one of the first sort of black athletes that was kind of an MK Ultra athlete, right? 
And then now we have all of these gymnasts, all of these people like Serena Williams and LeBron James and Simone Biles and whatever that you and I would probably consider to be MKLs for athletes. Yeah. Was Willie, was Willie Gallimore and by genetics and whatever his son, Ron, is Ron Gallimore an MKL triathlete? Are yeah, I mean, I am kale triathletes. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, quite possibly. Um, his dad died in a car accident, hmm. but uh, he was uh, he was quite the football player. He wasn't very big, but mm -hmm. he was yeah, incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. Incredibly. And so, these are some very interesting connections. By the way, I think uh, if there's anybody that could take Ron Gallimore down, I think it would be Ali Raceman. Just based Race. on her chart. And you said something we were talking about that the connection she and I had had something to do with communication. Like there's yeah. part of me, like that, you know, she's, you know, at this point she's super famous and behind a lot of walls of managers and agents probably, but there's part of me that would like to, you know, reach out to her and have a conversation with her about this. I don't know if she'd understand some of the things I'm talking about. It would sound crazy to her, but it is, I mean, you know, like what you've been saying about the astrology gives me a little bit more confidence that maybe that's something I should do at some point, you know? And the other thing that is interesting is it brings us right back to if Ron Gallimore, I thought of OJ Simpson and MKL triathlete and OJ Simpson was involved with the Kardashians. And we were just talking about Cher and the Kardashians and Sonny Bono and here's Mary Bono. What is going on? Yeah. Well, I mean, Bobby <laughs> Kardashian is the, uh, might be the missing link in there. Right? Is he the lawyer or cover up or of the MKL athlete? You know, so OJ Simpson, you know, his going down probably had to do with a lot more than just whatever happened with him and Nicole Brown Simpson, right? It had to do with a lot more stuff than that, wouldn't you think? Yeah, OJ's an interesting character. Yeah. Um, you know, he, when he was, uh, you know, he grew up in a, a pretty rough part of uh, San Francisco. Mm hmm. And he played at San Francisco City College. And uh, his City College buddy was Al Cowings. Mm -hmm. And so OJ was offered any number of scholarships. And, and he was offered a you know, full ride, two years for him, um, uh, to uh, USC. Mm -hmm. And OJ said, well, the only way that I'll play at USC is if you give a scholarship to Al. So... Al Callings went to went to USC, and then when OJ went to uh, Buffalo mm -hmm. by the Bills, Al Callings went to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So Al Callings and OJ are linked from San Francisco through LA all the way up to Buffalo. Now, I have heard this cannot be substantiated, but you can cruise around the internet, probably find some some. Uh, some dirt that will corroborate this, but I had heard that OJ had had a number of incidents at USC mm -hmm. where, where he had, uh, let's just say he treated some, some, some girls rough. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were swept under the carpet. So he had a history of, uh, being somebody who could be abusive. Mm -hmm. That was, that was part of his legacy at USC. And of course, he goes into the NFL, and then he marries Nicole Brown Simpson. And um, it, it, here's here's where I think the story gets very interesting, because OJ winds up getting a uh, a car dealership. Mm -hmm. What was it? Uh, was it Hertz? Hertz. Hertz. He, yeah, he had the, he had the contract with Hertz Rent a Car, and he'd be running through the airport with the briefcase he, and his trophy or whatever, and yeah. He got that. He he was introduced to Hertz through Nicole's father. Uh huh. That was the Hertz connection. And again, this is what I what I've heard. But I've I've heard that OJ and and through the various kind of Hertz franchises that he had, that there was money laundering going on from and through USC alumni. Sure. So OJ had been involved in kind of, again, theoretically high level organized crime, um, you know, dating back probably from maybe his days meeting some of the alums at USC, clearly up uh, through the connection with, uh, with Nicole Kidman's father. So I'm we're talking about some of the same stuff here. And we have Ron Gallimore at USA Gymnastics, 
covering up for Larry Nasser, covering up for Michigan State University, right? Alumni, the amount of money that's gone through Michigan State's athletic program and alumni is being used to pay some of these girls, right? Right. So, you know, these could be kind of similar characters in a certain way. I mean, obviously, OJ being much more famous and whatever than Ron Gallimore, but there's no reason they couldn't come from a similar kind of program, right? Well, here's what I think. I think that when you get to a certain level of organizational um, dynamics, like when you when you float near the apex, I believe that's where you you lose touch with gravity, and when and, and not necessarily in a bad way, but it's like the same rules don't apply, like the same kind of gravitational forces around laws, rules, edicts, sort of don't apply. And now you're, you're in that same kind of band and stratosphere with other people who have been untethered by forms of social gravity. That's what happens when you reach that apex. And when that occurs, then there's a whole new set of, of like rules of engagement. And that's when uh, crime, whether it's institutional crime, whether it's um, family crime, generational crime, and sort of, sort of the, 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 the networks that are involved at that level, that's when they really kick in. Mm -hmm. so, so whether, you know, Ron Gallimore and OJ are coming out of the same MK Ultra athlete factory, or whether they reach a certain level, and because of that, they're untethered by this social gravity, and people can begin to make up their own rules. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And the rest of us are down here, you know, at the bottom part or the middle part of the mountain or whatever. And we're looking up and we're, you know, having to toil and, you know, go through the, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day Saturnian bullshit that most people have to go through while these people have somehow disconnected from that. So I think, I think that's inherent in some ways in the system. And what's happened in the 20th century is that the athlete has seemed to have gotten greater access to that. Mm -hmm. And clearly you look at somebody like LeBron James, mm -hmm. who's uh, now he's in Los Angeles. Let's see what happens to LeBron James in Los Angeles. This will be very interesting yeah. to watch, by the so, way. The, the last couple of things I just wanted to hit on is I wanted to make clear, like when I mentioned the possibility of myself being an MK Ultra athlete, I was a very average gymnast. I mean, above average for normal people, right? But when you're going about creating some of these athletes in Ali Raceman and Simone Biles, there's hundreds or thousands that probably started off as part of the same program and certain, certain rise to the top. So, you know, like I don't consider myself to be anything special. I'm just noticing these connections. But the other thing that I wanted to bring up was something you noticed. We will link to in the, in the show description, this interview with Ali Raceman on the Today Show. But you were taking a look at sort of her, how she was, you know, her, her mannerisms, her, her eyes, her body, and you had some um, thoughts or remarks about that, and, and this goes to what we're talking about, so I just want to know if you want to share those. Yeah, I mean, so I was trying to read her energy, and I would say that by and large, she's, she's pretty congruent. Like, there's not a lot of disconnect between who she is and what she's saying, but there are certain points where she's either making an insinuation, um, a... a, a kind of an accusation uh, that she breaks eye contact with Hoda Kotb and looks away while she says it. And to me, and it's just, not just to me, but it's like that's a classic, basic, fundamental tell. When somebody is talking with you uh, and they, they break eye contact, sometimes they can be nervous and not want to look people in the face. You know, that, that, that's, you know, that happens, right? But she was doing it consistently through that interview, and it was right at specific points. Like she didn't continue to look at Hoda Kotb. So something about her is probably a little compromised, mm -hmm. you know. And maybe she knows certain things that she can't talk about. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's been a part of certain things that she can't talk about or address, and she can maybe do like high-level stuff. And maybe there's actual specific incidents and events. I don't know. But there was just something when it got to kind of a hot-button topic. She talked and 
right? That's what yeah. would happen. So that was, that was, you know, that, and, and again, normally people can be shy. They'll have a conversation and they'll look away. That's, that's not uncommon. But in an interview like that, where you're really trying to get a point across, she's a Gemini, she's obviously very articulate, to break the eye contact in those moments said something to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like Allie Raisman, and I think she's, you know, speaking her truth. But I also know that, you know, my, my intuitive take on it is she's been through programming. And so whether it's intentional on her part or not, she is serving an agenda. Well, you know, she could be serving one agenda while appearing to be fighting against the same agenda. Um, and that's not something I necessarily fault her for. I think that there's a lot of people, including Simone Biles, including Serena Williams, including LeBron James and all these people who like maybe on a very small level have some understanding of what's going on, but really don't understand what they're involved in and how they're actually you know, being pawns in the system that, that seems to be serving them, but really they're serving. Right. Um, a couple of people that were born, well, one person that was born on the same day as Ali Raceman, different year, but same day. This this will get you going a little bit. Uh, Anne Haish, born on the same day. Oh, that's that interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Anne Haish. Um, you, you know, you remember the story about her of the desert? Remember that? I remember like something happened and she kind of went crazy. I know she used to date Ellen DeGeneres and then she had some sort of psychological break. What happened? Yeah, I think she was like out in like Palm Desert or one of those places. Mm -hmm. uh, and she showed up at somebody's house and like, you know, and like they didn't know her and she asked if she could come in and drink some water because she's really thirsty. Mm -hmm. So she's drinking all this water and starts to tell them that she'd been abducted by by a UFO, mm. and, and was starting to tell tell them all about her UFO experience. Clearly, mm. you know, a bit disassociated. Mm -hmm. Like she, that was her breakdown. And if you look up Anne H. and you know the breakdown in the desert, it's, it's like it's pretty trippy. It's well, very it's and this kind of brings us, in a way, full circle back to Palm Springs, back to Palm Desert, where Sonny Bono was mayor and congressman for that district, where Mary Bono is from, right? Where the To the Stars Academy stuff was, has been going on, those meetings, right? And the copywriting of, Cor of Colin Kaepernick with the swoosh of Saturn and the copywriting of Corey Good with the SSP, the Secret Space Program. And I've talked before on our show and I don't think on your show, but on our show about how uh, a lot of this abduction, UFO, secret space program memories, right? They're screen memories for sexual abuse. Right. Right. When I was just starting to realize that something funny had gone on with me, sexual abuse wise as a kid, somebody showed up trying to convince me that I'd been to Mars with him, right? <laughs> And I have a lot of funny ideas. I don't think I've been to Mars, right? Um, right. I'm hundred percent sure I haven't been to Mars unless Mars is in the hills of Chatsworth. I haven't been there. Right. Um, but that sh there is this weird, you know, I would definitely say Anne Hesh shows the signs of, of MK Ultra and all the things that go along with that. Right. So yeah. there's this weird connection between all of this space stuff, aliens, UFOs, abductions, whatever. Right. With, you know, as, sort of a distraction from mind control and sexual abuse, which is what I think we're really dealing with here, you mm -hmm. know, and, and not to bring UFOs and aliens. I, I've not, UFOs and aliens have never been like really a thing for me other than, you know, I deal with it now because of this community that I'm in, but that has never been, you know, my stuff. I see this, my experiences as having been mind control, but um, that is interesting with Anne Hish that, you know, she's out there, has been abducted, who knows what she was, you know, maybe had a mind control experience, but seems to think she had an, an alien or a UFO experience, right? I think that's pretty common in these, uh, in these kind of, you know, situations and events that it's so much easier to think of a traumatic experience of having happened from a, at the hands of something that is other, right? That's the perfect way to screen memory something, don't you think? Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I mean, Kathy O'Brien talks about that, and she talks about um, uh, what's what's his name, uh, Patrick Leahy, mm -hmm. which which we talked about, Senator, Senator, yeah, and how 
uh, when when you know that he would show up as a as what was as a as an alien or something like that. Mm -hmm. He talks about screen memories. And guys yeah. from the gymnastics community who see who hear this, like we're the, we recognize that this sounds insane. We're not sitting here saying that you know this is what's happening, but this is the level of mind control and and uh, amnesia and abuse that people are under, right? I mean, it, it sounds nuts. It sounds nuts to me. Doesn't it sound nuts to you? But that doesn't, it doesn't sound nuts to me. But you know, you're talking to the wrong person, probably. I mean. I, look, look, I, I think the, the, big, the bigger picture piece is that we live in a society mm -hmm. of lots of different levels of mind control. Mm -hmm. There's overt, there's covert, there's subtle, there's not so subtle. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the most benign, of course, is a commercial to try to get you to, mm -hmm. to buy something, right? Then, and then now that there's different levels of commercials now. Where and there's, no, there's no brand more commercialized than Nike with that Saturn swoop. Yeah, no, that, that's very true. So it points to space. It points to mind control. It points to control of time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about here. When I say it sounds nuts, obviously what we deal with, it doesn't sound nuts to me anymore at this point. But I understand why this sounds nuts to people, you know, who, who aren't familiar with the information you and I are familiar with. Um, it's quite an interesting world we live in. Well, I mean, it, what's interesting is that it's, it's starting to come out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it comes out in various ways. Like there's, you know, there's the social critique uh, of, you know, truth, you know, conspiracies, whatever. I mean, that part is coming out in mm -hmm. kind of a big way as, as maybe, you know, kind of a, a defense, like, you know, like a first line of defense to, to guard the chickens from the hen house, you know, or whatever, you know, it's like mm -hmm. that. And, but it's also coming out in people like the seeing things, like why did this happen? How did this happen? Uh, people are questioning reality more than ever. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then, then reality becomes questionable. And people are like, well, what is this? Where are we? Have you heard of this guy? Have you heard of this guy named Kalindi? Mm -mm. So Kalindi is this guy, you know, African gentleman who does these mega, mega, mega doses of like psychedelics, like 30 grams of mushrooms or more at a time, right? Right. And Sonia just recently did an interview with him. They were talking about something else, but there's a lot of interesting interviews with him uh, on, you know, you can find on YouTube or whatever. And he's talking about like, he could be sitting in a room where he's, you know, completely sober and the room is a room. And then when you're on all these grams of mushrooms, suddenly there's aliens coming through. Suddenly there's all, you know, all these different creatures and figures, you know, it's kind of like what your cat sees, right? Like there's all these different frequencies or bands of reality and it's yeah. just, which one have you tuned into? Yeah. And especially now with all this frequency and Wi-Fi soup we live in, you know, there, all this stuff may be there all the time, and it's just a matter of how how expanded your awareness or your mind is, and what you can see at any one time. Yeah, I mean, I mean that was like uh, Terrence and Dennis McKenna's launch pad. Yeah. When they when they started to explore psychedelics, they would go to Mexico and they they would eat like sure. yeah. copious amounts of mushrooms. I don't think they ever did thirty. Uh, maybe maybe they didn't do thirty. They did a lot yeah. though. Kalindi's crazy. <laughs> and, and so they would start to talk in these alien languages. Yeah, glossolalia. Well, they would do they would do these like clicks. They would talk in this click language. Mm -hmm. My dad talks. My dad uh, speaks a dialect from somewhere in Africa that has yos. I can't do it yosa, but it has those kinds of clicks and it. it's a similar yeah, kind that's, of thing. That's what they were talking in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, yeah, we we're living. We're li yeah, I mean, so so one of the things that that Aldous Huxley talks about in uh, the Doors of Perception is he talks about that we live with this thing in our brain, and, it, and it's called a limiter. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he actually was able to locate it biologically, but the limiter basically steps down stimuli mm -hmm. so that we can live quote unquote everyday life. So it's like a boundary guard. Yeah, and so a, or a limiter, filter, governor, whatever. Yeah. You want. And then what happens is that when you 
take psychedelics, the limiter gets turned off. Mm -hmm. And the more you take, the wider the aperture gets. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea here is for us to be able to do what we do on a daily basis. Uh, we've got we've got these built-in limiters. Mm -hmm. So when that goes away, though, then we get to see things in a very different light. And, you know, what and Blake Blake would say, you know. Uh, when the doors of perceptions are cleansed, we see all things as they are infinite. Mm -hmm. So this is this is really the reality behind the reality that we're in. And you take and you take the limiter away, or you or you open it up, and the next thing you know, you're having a very different different relationship with things. Yeah. And there are some people. If you notice this. There are people who have naturally dilated pupils. Yeah. You ever, if you ever hang around somebody that's got really big pupils, I guarantee you that person is a trip. Mm -hmm. That they're really interesting, they're high energy, uh, not always really grounded. But you can, because that's the effect of mm -hmm. what it's like to be, right? You have your dilated pupils and you're high and you're letting more information in. There's times when my pupils are huge. I remember you and I having that meeting in Whole Foods in Austin where you told me my consciousness was psychedelic and then the glass popped, remember? Yeah. <laughs> There's times when I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, wow, if I'm high, I didn't get to enjoy it because, but my eyes are, my pupils are huge, you know? Yeah, you probably don't need anything. You're I don't need anything. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's interesting. Colindy, I'll check him out. Yeah. All right, so we've whipped through a bunch of stuff here. And um, as always, it's an interesting ride with you, Robert. <laughs> yeah, totally, right? I mean, we're on it together. And uh, yeah, you and, I, you and I definitely connect and open up some cool pathways. So. Yeah, so we've opened up the, 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 the Ron Gallimore connection today. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think I really do. Looking at this chart of Ali Raisman con in connection with Gallimore, I, I think she could be the person mm -hmm. that could really shed some light on this man's um, persona, right? Yeah. See what happens, yeah. All right. Well, guys, if you want a reading, hit up Robert, robertphoenix.com. If you want a wellness consultation, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer. You can find me at offplanetradio.com. And we will be back really soon with another Matrix Mash. See you later. All right, cool.